to join your chat channel meanwhile why don't you invite your friends relatives and families don't hesitate to share the information at your social media channels and also send sms message via whatsapp telegram signal wouldn't be better to get it out and later on just say okay we informed you but the data breach was not as big as we thought or maybe there wasn't any data breach wouldn't that yeah build more trust now how can we trust and basically uh, trust is a really important word here in that to build trust you need to be transparent and this is what the gdpr encourages organizations to do The idea of Willardering is pretty simple, uh, I would say. So, the robot that we are building at the moment is uh, supposed to pick up uh, golf balls autonomously on a golf course or on the range. Can affect the decision. If it is diverse board, does it have a positive impact on corporate social responsibility or has no impact? To the day, I didn't test, but according to the literature and according to previous work, it must have a positive impact on the integration of those criteria in CEO compensation, especially the independent, the independent member, because. I'm Dr. Zura is not going somewhere else. My guest is from Stockholm, but from very nice island, Vaxholm from Stockholm. Karen, welcome. How are you? I'm good, thank you. It's snowing here. Typical April weather weather for Stockholm. So um, the dog's happy. <laughs> we cannot complain from this weather, unfortunately, because this is nature. But if you haven't lived in Sweden so long, then it can be challenging. My, of course, uh, my guest might wonder why we use GDPR practitioner. She's, from my view, she's an expert, but she doesn't like to call herself as an expert. But maybe she can explain why she negotiated with me not to use that title. Yeah, so I don't consider myself to be an expert. Nobody can be an expert in GDPR. You know, the GDPR is comprised of 250 plus pages of legal stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it has everything there from, uh, you know, from privacy, um, the rights of privacy, the right for choice, uh, human rights elements to um, information security in Article 32. Uh, so no, I cannot claim to be an expert of every single part of the GDPR. Um, the best experts that I know, or the best people I know, in fact, in fact, to be a data protection officer, are people that are project managers. And um, they are people that have worked in an organization for 20 to 30 years, maybe. They know every nuance of the organization. They know who's who and what's, who's good at what. And the most wonderful quality of a great PM is they don't mind saying, I don't know, but I know who does. Mm -hmm. and that's cool. Is it like the orchestrating? Like you need to orchestrate? Yeah, I think like uh, when you're thinking about an orchestra uh, yes. and you need to, you know, you are the person, you're the spindle, you're the spider in the web. Um, I almost spoke in Swedish then. <laughs> so you're the spider in the web uh, and you know to, you need to know which strings to pull. And 
honestly what the most important thing is, and this is why I call myself a practitioner, is that you, I am not worried about saying, I don't know. But so I know who might who know, knows? or I know I know who might know who might know someone. <laughs> and sometimes we start off, you know, when uh, Louis Armstrong and landed on the moon, the the Americans they didn't know how to get to the moon to start with. You need to find out how to get there first. But the thing is, you decide this is where I want to go, and then you need to work out how to get there. Yes, I I think it is very important to to say. I don't know also to know when you don't know instead of claiming that you know everything. Today we will talk about booking.com, what happened uh, with the data breach of booking.com and what do you think as a GDPR practitioner? Can you please briefly tell us about this uh, case and what do you think? Yeah, um, well to start with I saw it had been a breach uh, and the potential risk to the rights and freedoms of the individual or the natural person as it's uh, called in the GDPR uh, was quite high because it was actually credit card um, details that had been stolen um, mm -hmm. about 300, a little bit less than 300 and for about 90 to 100 of those the CVV that little three-digit code on the back of your credit card mm -hmm. had also been stolen. So um, this can actually cause quite some damage uh, to the natural person. Now, this actually happened in 2018. Uh, the fr it was first noticed or the first symptom was recorded. I think it was on, just look on my blog post here. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. was on the 9th of January. Mm -hmm. uh, 2018 and there was a customer of a hotel that complained that something was not right about uh, the credit mm -hmm. card or some credit card payment and then on the 13th there was another customer from the same hotel and it was on the 13th of January that triggered an investigation an internal investigation to understand the extent of what breach. this was was this a personal data breach yes because you know credit cards the credit card numbers maybe she the customer had been purchasing something somewhere else mm -hmm. uh, so you can't guarantee that it actually comes from booking.com however in this case it did come from booking.com and they started their investigation and they followed it in a way which is good practice to find the root cause to find the extent and to sort of think, okay, what the hell can we do about this? The mistake that they made and the reason why they got fined 475,000 euro is because they did not report within 72 hours of being aware that there had been a personal data breach, which was on the 13th of January. Why didn't they, re they report. report? Why do you think? What yeah. was wrong there? Be <laughs> well, they did an investigation and they reported, so they did report the breach, but they didn't report it until, oh, it was the beginning of February. Mm -hmm. So it was, I'm I can't see it here, the 7th of February they reported it, mm -hmm. which is basically a little bit too late uh, yes. because the law basically says within 72 hours of being aware of the breach. However, Booking.com, they wanted to be sure. They wanted to be sure, one, a breach actually had occurred, mm -hmm. and they wanted to be sure, understand the extent of the breach. Mm -hmm. And I see this happening actually where I would imagine if you sort of wanted to get behind the scenes of what was happening, I would imagine mm -hmm. if they had a DPO like me, that DPO would be saying, let us report now. Mm -hmm. um, but the business is saying, let us be sure before we report, because as soon as we report, then it shows that we have done something wrong mm -hmm. and clearly this is quite serious uh, quite a serious breach so there was probably some discussions quote unquote behind the scenes between mm -hmm. the DPO uh, and the organization where the DPO is standing in the shoes of the data subject you can you can consider the DPO the data protection officer like a consumer advocate mm -hmm. uh, it's basically standing in the shoes of the data subject uh, and the organization is also looking at other kinds of organizational risks, like what about the risk to our brand? Mm -hmm. What happens if this gets out and it's not really a I breach? Mm -hmm. But yeah. was it, so, wouldn't, wouldn't it be better to get it out and later on just say, okay, we informed you, but the data breach was not as big as we thought, or maybe there wasn't any data breach. Wouldn't that yeah. build more trust, 
Now, how can we trust booking that? Yes, book? and ba and basically, uh, trust is a really important word here in that to build trust you need to be transparent and this is what the GDPR encourages organizations to do so you can use the GDPR as a trust mechanism mm -hmm. in your organization to your ecosystem so it can actually be something that's very positive now back to the breach mm -hmm. the fact is the breach report that you is a template that you download from the supervisory authority and this was actually um, the lead supervisory authority was actually in Holland mm -hmm. it's actually designed in a way so that you can just do a preliminary report mm -hmm. to say look you know a breach a personal data breach has occurred we think uh, and this is the extent of what the breach is, although we're not absolutely sure. But basically, you have the opportunity to s just write something down. Um, and, and, and that's good practice. Um, and this is basically how they could have avoided mm -hmm. this fine, because they did not get fined for lack of security controls or the fact that the breach happened or mm -hmm. that they weren't careful enough. They just got fined for this one thing. But what is really interesting is that when I posted this on my blog, Virtual Shadows, mm -hmm. um, one of my other GDPR well, practitioner legal guys, he actually was on the blog and he wrote a comment which is super interesting. And he's really, uh, what happened is that uh, Booking.com then claimed because you only you can only report a data breach to the supervisory authority if you are a data controller if you are a data processor mm -hmm. which means that you act on the instructions of the data controller mm -hmm. then you will actually report the personal data breach to the data controller mm -hmm. and so Constantine he basically said yes but you know then booking.com they basically said yeah they filed a breach report but it was a mistake because they are the data processor Mm -hmm. And then I was thinking about this and I was thinking, well, they are actually because the hotel is the data controller. Mm -hmm. It's the hotel that is the data controller to their customers. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but then we start to get complicated because when does that, if booking.com is a data processor, this doesn't make sense because the customer is booking, they register with booking.com first. Yes. And it's booking.com that probably has a whole load of algorithms sitting behind the scenes deciding upon the type of hotels the customer sees. Yes. You know, maybe they, they may even make some decisions based upon the prices they're paying for the hotels, dependent upon what their activities are. So this makes them into a data controller. So then we start coming on to the scenario, okay, is it that the booking.com is a data processor and yes, maybe this breach is not, uh, they should have re shouldn't need to report to the supervisory authority, or are they a joint controller together with the um, hotel? Okay. Yeah, at the hotel, uh, because I can't see how they can be purely a data processor, because a data controller determines the purpose and means of processing a personal data. And this is what Booking.com does, because when I, I was just went on to Booking.com and I had a look around as a non-customer, and already, you know, it's collecting stuff. I've got cookies, so I'm a data controller for that. Booking.com is a data controller for that. Then I am registered with Booking.com, and I have all of the hotels that I've been uh, browsing, yeah. all the hotels that I stayed with. So Booking.com is the data controller for that. Now, when it comes to the payment of credit card payments, Mm -hmm. In that, you got the hotel, they would have actually been taking credit card payments themselves before, but now they're going through booking.com, so one could argue that they are a data processor, but still, this is, this is very tricky, uh, because basically what we have here is we have, it, it becomes very interesting case, not just because they did not report in time, mm -hmm. but then we start getting into the, the quandrum of, is booking.com a data controller or are mm -hmm. they a, really a data processor like they are claiming or are they a joint controller and i would say that there is too many unanswered questions now and this is where i need to pull in the legal guys to see the contract between the hotel 
and booking.com to mm -hmm. see what the hotel has instructed booking.com to do or maybe booking.com they have a general contract for all of the hotels which i expect to be the case yes. and their data processing agreement you know so basically in order for booking.com to be a data processor they need to act strictly on the instructions of the data controller which is every one of these hotels and bed and breakfasts and everything can i have a question because i'm confused here a bit because the way that I see booking.com is the one that dictates how hotels should use their platform first. Second one, like uh, how can I know as a customer who should I make keep responsible from this process? Because now they are just throwing responsibility to each other by, you know, yeah. play in the playground. And, and then, OK, I thought I am giving my credit card details to booking.com and booking.com is in a way acting that, oh, I did nothing, it is the hotel. Was, wasn't it at the booking.com platform, the data breach happened? Or is it the hotel yeah. was distributing credit yeah. card information? Yeah, so basically, clearly, uh, booking booking.com is responsible for the data breach, irrespective of whether they are acting on the instructions of the data controller or whether they are acting on their own instructions as a data controller. So, clear. The problem is that if there is a joint controllership here, there must be a contract implemented between Booking.com and the hotels that basically says, okay, which parts are we data controller and which parts are you data controller and then there also needs to be a decision made through whom should the data uh, the data subject um, go to if they mm -hmm. have questions concerning the collection and processing of their personal data because we don't want to get into this ping pong yes. ball situation yes. it is ping pong yes you're right yeah um, so basically, you know, my based upon what I know now, I would say that uh, Booking.com were correct to report the per personal data breach to the supervisory authority. It's just that they should have done it within 20, 72 hours. That Constantine says that they are claiming something about being a data processor is fascinating. Uh, so mm -hmm. I would. Be, I would be challenged to see how they could be a data processor because they have so much interface with the customer. Yes. But having said that, it's like I said, you know, it's not that they got the interface with the customer, but they are determining the purpose and means on the collection and processing of personal data. So, you know, who should the data subject go to? Clearly, they should go to booking.com because that is yes. who they booked the hotel through, yes. not to the control through to, to the hotel. However, maybe there is a joint controllership here. Mm -hmm. It is very interesting case. So what we are going to do right now is going to wait about the details of the decision so that we can understand how the process is going to happen. So what can we learn from that? Yes, well, takeaways is very straightforward. If you think you've had a personal data breach, and in this case, there was evidence two instances whereby the same thing had happened through the same channels, mm -hmm. which was enough to say, okay, we have a problem. Just send a preliminary report mm -hmm. to the supervisory authority mm -hmm. in whichever country you happen to be in if you are the data controller, mm -hmm. if you are the data processor, which means you are acting strictly on instructions mm -hmm. from the data controller, then you will make this report to the data controller or to a processor that is the, if you are a sub-processor of a processor, mm -hmm. the reports to the data controller, there's a long chain. Yes, very you long need to chain. Do this as yeah, you need to do this as soon as you are aware this personal data or this incident has occurred. 
that's it. Don't hang around and investigate. Just do the preliminaries, have enough information to report that what has happened. Uh, because the thing is, is that once you have reported to, if you are a data processor and you've reported to a data controller, they have to report within 72 hours to the supervisory authority. Mm -hmm. I understand. Transparency is the most important thing. Be transparent and do it as soon as you can. And that way, you won't get fined for reporting a personal data breach late or yes. incorrectly. It is a lot of money, especially when, when they're in the, this type of crisis right now, like tourism is yeah. almost dead, etc. Thank you very much for joining from Vaxom. I hope the sunny days will come soon and then you can enjoy great sun in your island. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs>
in the course we uh, took our time and went out to some customers uh, and uh, asked some questions uh, and we got a really good response about the concept we were on to. Uh, so then we figured we should maybe continue and give this a shot. I know that also you took some business education also. Do you think business education also adds, adds up? Like, because there are many engineers, they want to start their own business. Do they need to take some business related courses to understand, as you said, like talk to a customer or do you think it is better to focus on engineering more? Mm -hmm. uh, good question. Uh, in the company pretty soon or pretty early, you would need some sort of help, I would say, with uh, everything that's uh, not related to the technology. So in the beginning, we were just focusing on that. Uh, we were uh, lucky thanks to KTH Innovation and others, uh, but mainly because of them, to get some uh, basic information about how to pitch the idea, marketing, sales, uh, uh, some general information about the economy, and also getting into a community with uh, other startups uh, uh, to help each other out. So that gave a huge, huge boost in the beginning compared to just us being in the lab doing working of on course. technology. So, so when you start your business, is it hard to convince people that you have a company that you can sell products? Also, one challenge could be maybe to find prospective partners and prospective investors. How is the <coughs> entrepreneurship ecosystem in Stockholm in that sense? Mm, uh, the ecosystem in Stockholm is uh, in general pretty good and it's uh, be evolved a lot the last uh, years. So there's a big uh, network and uh, uh, like the, the good thing I think we have done pretty good is to be pretty open with the, what we are doing and uh, connecting with a lot of people. So then it got easier to find persons or people who were interesting and uh, are, um, uh, are, are able to invest in the company. Uh, so in the beginning it was quite innovation and then later for us we were in a program called Sting Incubate. Yes. That's an uh, yeah, uh, incubator here in uh, Stockholm where you can get help with your idea. So that uh, made it, uh, we got into a community thanks to that. Uh, for us, it's been, uh, I would say, the idea is a bit uh, difficult to maybe raise money. Hardware in general is tougher compared to software because you can steal much faster, which um, investors in general are more interested in. Uh, so, and for us, it's both time and uh, uh, money consuming in the beginning to develop it because we didn't really have a platform to start on, to start off with. So we had to build most of it by ourselves, both hardware and software. So it's taken some time. Uh, but luckily there were, we find some uh, thanks to the communities, I guess, uh, here in Stockholm that were, uh, that wanted to invest in, in this idea. How do you recruit talents also? Because recruiting people to regular company is different than recruiting to startups. So what are you mm -hmm. looking when you are hiring anybody? Mm -hmm. That's a really good and uh, tough uh, question. Uh, for bigger companies, uh, or like in, in a startup, uh, you might not have the money, so it's more that you can uh, put up shares in the like a company that later on might be value, valuable. Uh, and you also can uh, uh, more like sell the vision of the company, I would say. So try and get people on that uh, understands what you want to achieve. So it's very important to try and uh, communicate what, what, what's the purpose of the company. Or, and if you are able to communicate that, then I would say it's uh, a lot easier to find talents. Uh, for our part, uh, since we started a project in school, I think that helped a bit because uh, uh, I knew people, <laughs> so we recruited the early stage before uh, like uh, large companies got their hands on them. <laughs> uh, so we got a pretty good uh, fun uh, basic team in the company uh, that we started it with. So, so it yeah. is important to have like core team when you are studying because we, so they are not recruited yet. Because is it difficult to hire people from traditional? 
uh, experiences like maybe they have higher demands or maybe I know some people also they are bored to work in large corporations they really experience they want to experience mm -hmm. startups did you have any type of this case or did you hear uh, mm, uh, I would say, yeah, it is of course harder to hire from people or uh, people or talents that are in in a large company already, since they have some standard of the salary, etc. And that can be hard for a startup to uh, match, of course. Um, so I guess it's easier, uh, but on the other side, it's probably more senior competence that can be very valuable for the startup. Uh, because you can save a lot of uh, or take a lot of shortcuts with a person who has some experience in the field, and uh, that, that could be the downside when hiring younger talents. Uh, so I guess it's a bit of a trade-off. But uh, I would say, it, of course, it's harder to find senior talent that is willing to go down in salary. Uh, then you really have to sell in the purpose and vision of the company. Vision. Yes. So what are what, what are your next plans for the company? Uh, so where we are, are at now is that we have been developing this for a few years and the uh, robots are now deployed on uh, customers here in Sweden. So we have some robots up and running at the moment doing the uh, job, which is pretty cool. Uh, it's taking some time. This uh, is great, actually. Yes. That's a lot of fun. So we are uh, starting to have paying customers. Uh, How coronavirus, the situation, what is happening in the world influence your business? Mm -hmm. um, we aren't so many in the team, so and we have hardware. So we, some of us at least have to be in the office. Uh, so we've been uh, uh, mostly working uh, in the office here in uh, Stockholm. Um, in general, the golf has been going really good uh, around the world. Yes, uh, actually, because it's a good sport to be outside and have a distance between each other. So I think uh, in Sweden, it increased 40% or so uh, income on uh, in average on the golf courses. And this year seems to be uh, on the same path or something. Uh, so that has helped us because those are the customers. and. Uh, they have money that they can spend on investments. So that's been uh, actually uh, so far uh, uh, good for us. <laughs> Interesting. So it seems some businesses are go growing even though because of the corona. Thank you. So the next step for us is to try and or like continue to make the robot as robust as possible uh, so it doesn't break. Uh, we have learned that the customer, uh, customers are expecting it as an elevator, for instance. So an elevator, you get really frustrated if it doesn't work. You just expect mm -hmm. it to work. Uh, and it's a bit the same with our product, but it's a uh, yeah, fully autonomous system. So a lot of things can uh, go wrong. So we are trying to yeah, make it as robust as possible. So we're working a lot on the tech side. With it because stuff. it can um, fall inside the lake if it doesn't detect or something can happen be stuck yep. in the mud? Yeah, there are uh, a lot of things that can go wrong. Uh, so that's one side. And then uh, on the other side, we're working on the sales and partnership to try and uh, start expanding outside uh, Sweden, because there are other countries where golf is uh, bigger, for instance, in the US. So you want to expand to US or do you want to go to other European countries first? Uh, the idea for us is uh, to focus on Europe and US. Uh, so, like, uh, we are uh, aiming to do it uh, in parallel of it, actually. So, when you look at the past, if you need to give some advices to students right now or new entrepreneurs, what do you advise them to do as soon as possible? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, write down ideas would be like a uh, number one tip if you are not in a startup or like in general. Uh, and then uh, either the next day or a uh, bit forward, you, it might be something that you, it's, uh, either you have time or it's a good idea that you can work on. Um, for, or like in, as a student, you usually uh, get, very are usually it's easier to uh, get help. <laughs> And uh, and uh, 
So for us, we were in the K8 innovation, for instance, and uh, everything is for free since uh, yeah, it's paid uh, because you are a student or if you are a, a doctor. Uh, so if you have an idea, I would really recommend to give it a shot. You don't really have anything to lose on it. It's just uh, experience uh, that you gain from it, uh, and uh, it's. Uh, in my experience, easier when you are in the uh, studying to do these projects. Uh, it might be harder later on when you have fam family and a stable income. Uh, so why not uh, take a shot? Uh, and yeah, that would be my two advices in the early stage. Uh, and for a startup, uh, what helped me a lot is to be pretty open. Maybe not. Uh, Can you define open? Like, is it just uh, to share the uh, idea, or what is what do you mean with open? Mm, generally, I would say sharing the idea and the concept, and don't be afraid of uh, competition. Uh, but if they I, steal my idea, because if I say robots that collect balls in the golf area, like golf, mm, like what if they steal my idea? What do you recommend? Mm, I would say there is a risk. Uh, in my case, we are quite confident since it's not that easy to build it, so it's hard for a single person to the day after just uh, invent the idea. It takes time and resources, but of course talking uh, to a lot of people then it might reach uh, larger companies and that can be a competitor within a pretty short period. Uh, but for us it's been so far worth the risk. Uh, I would say I'm it, it's probably not a unique idea with having uh, a robot collecting the gold fringe autonomously. So I assume there are a lot of other people who have thought about the idea. So the idea is usually the simple part. The hard part is to execute it. Uh, that takes uh, another level of uh, work. Uh, so for yeah, I'm gonna stick with uh, like the target people. That usually helps, but. It could be something that you might not want to share, so you don't have to like share everything if there is something that is like a key thing that maybe you can patent, for instance. Then you, of course, should be careful what you are saying, but usually the vision you can talk about. Be because usually when you come up with an idea, people might say, oh, what if Electrolux does the same robot because they are already doing, you know, this cleaning robots at home, so they can do something similar. So did you hear this type of comments? Oh. If what if this competitor does the same? What are you going to do? Did you hear this type of question mm -hmm. you? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, of course. Investors uh, asking that, for instance, uh, to uh, try and be sure that uh, we won't uh, or that we will exist within like a year and more. I'm gonna be pretty specific for our case uh, since that's what I have experience uh, on, but. Uh, for instance, one company for us would be Husqvarna, since they are a large uh, brand within yes. uh, autonomous uh, lawn mowing. Uh, the advantage for us is that we have chosen a pretty uh, narrow market, uh, the gold range. So those uh, are a lot less of compared to a number of uh, grass fields at home. Mm -hmm. um, so what we have understand, it's a bit too small compared to uh, the general uh, lawn moving market for uh, Husqvarna and other brands to mm -hmm. go for. It's not really worth the uh, money for them, but for us it's a perfect place to start off with. Uh, and then we also have a partnership with a company who are the largest supplier of uh, golf uh, products for the golf range. <laughs> Uh, and the, it's a Swedish company, and they are located here in Halmstad. So we are collaborating on this, and we are providing uh, kind of uh, everything we need uh, around the robots to make a fully autonomous system on the golf range. So that could be a, a ball washing machine, elevator, a dispenser where you store the balls, wow, and a trailer that collects the golf balls. Uh, and that's all not only the brand that they uh, are providing, um, but also like the marketing, the sales and the uh, distribution channels. Uh, so that's why we can go a lot faster to the US market, for instance, because they already have the, uh, everything uh, up and running over there. And they have like containers going every month. 
så det kan ge oss uh, add robots to the container så vi don't have to think about the shipping etc. Per- perfect, perfect. It, it seems that uh, if you find a very nice niche market that big competitors doesn't care but plus a good partner that is not competing with you but that can add up your product to their own mm. other products and services then it became perfect match. Impressive. Mm. Mm. And then, so that's two, yeah, two things and then I would say the third thing for us is that uh, you can't really do this within like a, a week or so, the product that has been developed. Uh, that's the downside with hardware, it takes uh, more time, but the upside is it's harder to just jump onto it and develop it. Uh, it takes time money and the engineers to develop it. Yes, actually I like to have like physical products, you know, it is nice because software, okay, you can have maybe develop a bit faster, but maybe replication is easier, plus it is difficult to communicate, but when you say there's a robot collecting uh, golf balls yeah. in the yeah. zone, that is wonderful. Thank you mm-hmm. very much for joining to Dr. Zero Show, I appreciate your time and I wish you great success and luck in your future projects also. And uh, thanks for having me. Uh, Thanks a lot. (laughs) Dr. Zero Show right now will connect to France to University of Lorraine. Hussein Balouk is PhD candidate at University of Lorraine. Thank you very much, Hussein, for joining to Dr. Zero Show. Yeah, no, it's a pleasure, Dr. Zero, to be with you today. Thank you. I know about your research. We will come to that one. I just want to discuss about your research about CSR and the finance. But I would like to know what is CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility? Can you please explain to me? Well, uh, as its name, it's Corporate Social and Environmental Responsibility. So it's about uh, giving back from uh, the enterprise to the society. And in our day, there is a big and important question. It's the climate change. So also taking in consideration the environment by its behavior. So taking action to have this contribution of society, of enterprise in the society and in the environment. This is like, for I can give, for example, like project, green projects are one of corporate social responsibility. Being good with employee is one of of corporate social responsibility. So we have a big expression that can grow a lot of environmental and social behavior of enterprise. I have, you know, usually when I hear about CSR, companies are doing CSR, I just feel that, or I think that they are just using their marketing budget for CSR just to get promotion, word of mouth, and they are just seeing it as a promotion, not that they really care about the environment, about other stakeholders, about the society. Am I wrong? Well, it can be. And sometimes it is only and uh, for increasing the visibility uh, in the media can be uh, to legitimate their activity. For example, many studies prove that a society that have a bad impact on the environment, like for example, all society we are uh, a major player in corporate social responsibility are a major play- player in showing uh, their corporate social activity so it can be but also it can be for uh, the good uh, of the community so we have uh, we have those two point of view so uh, in the research we have those point of view sometimes a lot of managers do it to legitimate uh, their activity to legitimate the activity of the enterprise but sometimes also they do it for the stakeholder, for creating value to stakeholder. So it will depend from the enterprise and enterprise to another. Your research is about CSR integration to CEO compensation. Can you please tell me a little bit about that? What have you been looking for? I look for uh, my, the research question is if the integration of those criteria are pushed by governance variable. By governance variable, I um, officially the ownership structure. If the shareholder push the enterprise to integrate criteria, extra financial criteria or CSR criteria in the compensation of CEO in order to increase his social and 
environmental performance. Does it mean that if they care about CSR, they will get much more payment? The compensation in general, the target of compensation in general is to push a tool, to push the manager in order to do what is the best for the shareholder. And in recent year, not only the shareholder, but the stakeholder. The question here is if if I found that the shareholder push the enterprise to integrate CSR criteria in the compensation of the CEO, it means that the CEO have this part in his uh, compensation for the sake of uh, stakeholder and shareholder. But if it's not, it means that the CEO use his power in order to have those criteria in his salary in order to increase his salary, first point. Second point, in order to legitimate his salary, because like we have a very big question about CO compensation in this uh, time, especially when we uh, when we are in times like like crisis. Like they are paid millions of dollars when their companies are not successful or they are damaging the society yeah. or the business. Yeah. So it, it can be used for this. So I, I have this uh, part of my salary because uh, my compensation because because I did a lot of uh, projects, uh, CSR project, a very good project for society, a very good project for environment. And also, it, the, the manager will be known by public. And we know that we are in kind of market of manager, like football players. So he, he, he will have this picture, like he's a person that, that work for all the stakeholders, not only for the shareholder. I have two questions right now about your research. First of all, in which country have you conduct your research to collect the data? Second one is, what did you find based on your research? I conduct my study about French uh, enterprise and especially the SPF uh, 120 uh, enterprise. And those are the biggest 120 enterprise in France. And one of the major results that especially institutional investors will push enterprise to take the decision to integrate CSR criteria. The question also can, can have this, this finding have an impact that also the institutional investor like insurance company or pension fund also have customers and also they have this publication about how they invest the money. So what they, what they do for also can be for marketing that I use the money in order to, uh, to, uh, to invest in enterprise that are good to the society and good to the environment. So this is one of the major findings of uh, my study. Can I ask you a question about that one? What do you mean with institutional investor? Do you mean like th these uh, venture capitalists as an investor? Or uh, no, institutional investor, uh, I have uh, many categories, many type of institutional investor because as we know that in in this, uh, institutional investors are not the same, don't, don't have the same objective. So, for example, insurance company, venture, hedge funds, pension fund, we can find between them that insurance company are the most engaged in pushing enterprise uh, to use those criteria in the CO compensation. Because like insurance company are the most impacted by the climate change. Because like when we have any, any accident because of the climate change, it will be, it will have a great impact on insurance first because they will pay for any damage. Okay. So this is uh, the major finding of my study. Is there any other findings? Because it's the first one, the major one, any yeah, other? Yeah, I, I work with actually also on uh, the internal governance variable and especially the board. So we look to the diversity of the board, for example, female or male the diversity by nationality, the number of board, uh, the, the number of board member, if the board member is independent or he is a manager in the enterprise, because there is many research that those factors can affect this decision. If it is diverse board, does it have a positive impact on corporate social responsibility or has no impact? To the day, I didn't test, but according to the literature, and according to previous work, it must have a, a positive impact on the integration of uh, those criteria in CO compensation, especially the independent, the independent member, because like those independent members represent more the stakeholder and not only, only the stockholder. If you look at a company, if they have the diverse board and if they are getting investment from institutional investors, most probably 
in a way that they, they are much more prone to have more responsibility to, to, to the environment. So bottom line is, can we say that if you want to have a better companies that cares about the environment, about the society, it's important that they have diverse board members and at the same time their investors are all, are not only venture capitalists but also institutional investors yeah because like institutional investors are a block holder especially for example when we talk about usa where pension fund have a very big volume of stock in the same company so they can control it they can push it to do mm -hmm. what they what they need and um, the diversity especially in france and in europe we have what we call internal governance are more important than external governance. So that it means that uh, the board is more important than the ownership structure. Okay. So we have recommendation in France oh, from IMF and uh, ATEP, and those are big institutions of governance in France that push enterprise to have diversity, more diversity, and more independent member in the board. When you mean diversity, do you mean like gender diversity or do you also mean the cultural background diversity or do you also mean the background, I mean, in terms of education? If you look to any report or reference report to a French company from the 120 company that I, I work on, you will find that they will talk about all what you say, it means that they talk about the diversity by, by sexual diversity, the diversity by nationality, the diversity by background. So because like uh, more we have diversity, more the board is more rich by different background from different different sex and different nationalities. So they can cover big uh, number of uh, stakeholders because they understand those stakeholders from their background. I, you know, I, of course I support diversity by all means, but I have a question sometimes also. If you have this diverse management, doesn't it also make it difficult to, to make decisions? Sometimes you need to be agile, take decisions fast. Maybe it's not about your research. You, you don't have to answer it. I'm just wondering. It's a big question. And especially when we talk about, I, I, uh, I work also on the number of board members. Mm -hmm. So when we have a small a small number of board members, it's really bad because we, we could not have uh, uh, what we need from diversity. It's a mm -hmm. small number. But also when we have a large number, it will be hard hard to have meetings because it's, it will be harder to assemble all, them, all the board. Mm -hmm. It will be hard to take a decision also. So yes. we have this choice and it can be a choice in the middle. So we can have this diversity, but we can also have fast decision and uh, better performance for the board. Is there any optimum so, number for a like small medium enterprise or large enterprise that have 1,000 people? Is there any percentage? In the France, it's maximum 18 person in the board. And at 12, more study found that at 12 member, it's very good, but below, like below nine, it can be complicated, like especially you must take in consideration the power of the CEO. Yes. Also, when we have a small number, director can have more power. Also, when we have a large number, so uh, we cannot control very good the director, the manager. I just wondered this about independent person. Sometimes there are some independent board member, but how can we be sure that they are independent? Because if this person makes money by being at that board so doesn't he try to satisfy or make happy other board members to stay as a board member because they are getting compensation how can we make sure that they are independent regardless of the decisions that they are pushing inside the board in france we have five or between five and eight criteria that we use to say that this member is independent or not and uh, those are criteria recommended by APEP medef So those criteria, if he have uh, uh, any family relation between him and uh, the manager or the CEO, if he had worked in the enterprise uh, in the past, if he worked in another enterprise that have a commercial relation with the enterprise. So we have many criteria 
And I think we have many, many also experience uh, in France that have proved that a dependent member, when we have a, a, serious, a serious problem, that can take action against CEO in order uh, to, to protect shareholder interests. Perfect. But when you mean shareholder, is not only the shareholders, like you also mean the stakeholders. Is it true? Or only shareholders? Stakeholders and shareholders at the same time. Uh, like independent member represents the whole because, but at the end, the shareholder also want that the enterprise respond and create value for stakeholder because stakeholder are client, banks, state, employee. So in order to maximize the value created by the enterprise in the future, in order to survive, we must respond to the whole stakeholder. So I think that either they represent the shareholder or the stakeholder, they will be the, the they will do their best in order to push the management to create value for both shareholder and stakeholder. Thank you very much for this nice conversation. I know you are going to defend your PhD soon. I wish you good luck and I miss to have conversation during break times over coffee with you. Looking forward to meet you and talk to you again. Thank you a lot for this opportunity. It was a great experience. Bye. Bye bye. Hi, I hope you had a great time at Dr. Zero Show. And if you want other people to hear it, please follow me at Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. Don't forget to follow Reportare and don't forget to follow Dr. Zero Show. If you have any suggestions, recommendations, please get in touch with me. I will be glad to communicate with you and listen what you suggest. See you. Bye.